Today we're on session nine of Remnant Boot Camp, and uh, I was kind of hoping for about 12 sessions, but to be truthful, probably next week will be our last session on 1 John. And God has us, uh, I believe, in mind to go some other places. I want to pick back up where we, 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 we kind of touched on 1 John 5, 1, 1 through 5 last week, and I got so happy that uh, I got to preaching and didn't really cover as much as I wanted to cover. How many know that's good when that happens? So let's go back again this morning to 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And I want to call this belief overcoming and commandments. Now, I want to preface this with something. I remember uh, years ago I watched a movie and, this, and there's a turning point because you have an enemy that's coming at you that believes something. He has a purpose, he has a plan, and that he is completely sold out to his belief. There comes a turning point in your life that you have got to believe in something. You've got to believe in a purpose and a power that's greater than you. Otherwise, you end up floundering your entire life. And the only thing that can come against an enemy that believes is a believer that actually believes. That we have got to, we have got to be embedded in our belief in who Jesus really is. We've got to be embedded in the power of the cross. We've got to be embedded in the power of the blood. We've got to be embedded in the power of this word that we have really got to believe that we're entering into a time that just kind of wondering isn't going to make it. You're going to get swallowed up in the belief of the other, the Antichrist, because he's fully committed, he fully believes, and the only thing that can stop him is your belief, your faith in what this word says and who Jesus says he is. And that's really the the whole dichotomy that's going on in 1 John is these two belief systems that are absolutely opposed to one another are clashing against each other. And if you're not solid in this one, if you're solid in who Jesus is, you're immovable. And the Antichrist can't get in. Let's look at this. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, he just said a lot right there. If he's Messiah, and there's a lot the Word of God says that Messiah is going to be, that he is Almighty God come in the flesh. He is the Son of God. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. Either Jesus is that, or he's a complete fraud and a complete liar which doesn't even make him a good man. You can't be a liar and a great teacher. It simply makes you a great deceiver. Either he is that or he's nothing at all. And that's really what he's getting into here because his antichrist spirit always tries to make Jesus something else. Well, he was was simply one of the ascended masters. No, he's not. That's a lie. He is the only ascended master. The master came down and he ascended back up and the same one's coming back again. And there's nobody else up there. There's no other ascended masters around him. Buddha isn't there. Zoeaster isn't there. The master, the king of heaven and earth came down. He first descended so that he could ascend. There's nobody else. He's not just a great teacher. Although he was that, when Almighty God came down, how many know that nobody was more qualified to teach the Torah than Jesus? Everybody else skewed at what they wanted and what they believed. He came down and lived it properly for three and a half years, an entire Torah cycle. Either he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he is Messiah, he is Almighty God, he is yod heh vav come in the flesh, or we might as well just wrap this thing up and go home. Because everything right now of society is to move you away from what the Word of God says he is. It's secularly, with it, most of Christianity is now arguing the virgin birth, is arguing his divinity. Even within the Messianic movement, they're arguing the divinity of Christ. The moment you do that, you fulfill what the Apostle John was warning about. In fact, next week we'll get into it. He says, if you see a brother sin, that sin's not the sin unto death. Well, what would be the sin unto death? denying the messiahship, the divinity of Jesus. 
you do that, then we go back into uh, Hebrews chapter, I want the chapter six, I believe. It talks about if you deny him that way, there's no other sacrifice left for you. It is go straight to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begotteth loveth him also that is begotten of him. This is the true love that I can sense true believers, not the religious spirit. I tell you what, I have a, a lot of people that call themselves Christians. I cannot stand to be around because they are filled with the religious spirit. And the spirit of God within me is repulsed by that religious spirit. It's like once you get rid of that spirit and you receive Jesus and you get saved and are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we can have some communion together. But I am not communing with another spirit because that same spirit will flip and follow the Antichrist in a heartbeat. I remember here years ago had a supposedly retired Methodist minister stop by the office. And the minute he walked in, my, my spirit it had that when all of a sudden you're spirit, it's like, no, don't let that filth into my office. And he started talking about, you know, well, some of the things I'm in, in, into is, 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 is mind development. It was new age stuff. And he tried to put junk on it. And uh, I started talking Torah, and he didn't like it. Why? Because the Torah is the antidote for everything that comes from Babylon, for the saved. He didn't like it. And I mean, there was a darkness came in with him. So as I, be, so I be, in my spirit, I began under my breath praying that darkness out. And he didn't, I mean, he was not far behind it. He got nervous and left. I don't want that stuff. But those that, you, 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 can, you can be in a shopping center or someplace. I, guys, I, I, when, I, when I have traveled, I have been overseas where we didn't even speak the same language. But immediately my spirit put, picked up that the spirit of God was on the inside of them. And there was a love there. My problem in America is I very rarely ever connect to people that call themselves believers anymore because it's primarily a religious spirit because the great falling away has happened. But they still stayed in church. They just created churches of the fallen away. That's why the remnants, you know, right now, in fact, I was talking with Rob Skeeb about this. He, one of the things he did for six and a half years, he was, he was working as a missionary overseas to where it was illegal publicly to be a Christian, so it was an underground movement. And he, he says, I can see that beginning to happen in America. While we have all these mega churches filled with, with so-called believers, the remnant have already begun going underground because they see the handwriting on the wall and they can't stomach their spirits cannot stomach a lot of this stuff that's simply a religious spirit. But I mean, you get 15, 20, 30, 40 believers in a room, you can have church. And there's nothing, there's nothing to mess up with it. And he says, listen, he said, now we love it. He says, but listen to this. By this we know that, the lo that we love the children of God. When we love God and say, it's okay no matter what you do. Just a bunch of greasy graves. We're going to splash it all over the place. Is that what the Apostle John says? Here's how I walk in the love of God. And this is how I can love my brother, that I keep his commandments. You see, if I keep the commandments of God, I'm not going to do you wrong. I'm not going to violate you in any way. I'm not going to rip you off in any way. I'm not going to be going around talking bad about you. I'm not going to do any of these things because all of that is violations of God's commandments. And so the best way for a community of believers to walk in love is to walk in the commandments of God because it maintains a squelching of the flesh, carnality, and religious spirits. He says, this is how you do this. Then he goes on to say, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments he repeats himself, doesn't he? What, hap what, what is that rabbinically when you, can, when you repeat yourself? It is very significant. In the last days, knowing who Jesus is and keeping the commandments are paramount for the stability of the remnant. If you don't have that, you're going to get hit by a freight train called the Antichrist. And he goes on to say his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Underline that in your Bible. You, If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, there is an overcoming force on the inside of you waiting to be released, but it is connected to the commandments, it is connected to who Jesus is, and it is connected to the abiding of the Holy Spirit within. When you put those together, you become an overcomer. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 
You got to believe. Do you believe this is the word of God? Do you believe this is inspired by God? And I mean from Genesis 1, 1, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, all the way to where it says the end is inspired of God, that God has supernaturally preserved this book, and there is no other book in existence that has that, that does what the word of God does and have the prophecies that have been fulfilled and are still waiting to be fulfilled. No other writing in human history has that. No other book in human history has transformed the lives of a multitude that has taken the worst of sinners and caused them to to be transformed on the inside. No other book. So I've either got to believe this book or I believe something else. It's time. I think what God is saying this morning is we're entering into a time you cannot stay on the fence anymore. Either you believe or you don't believe. But if you believe, you become an overcomer. If you don't believe, you're going to be washed up into everything that the world is doing and everything that the Antichrist is doing. Church, it is time that we stop trying to be like the world and start living a life that the world will want to start being like us. Come on now. I mean, it's getting ridiculous. We're struggling to be relevant to the world when that is never a mandate in Scripture. If I become relevant to heaven, I have something that the world needs. I have a testimony of how Jesus set me free. I begin to see God moving day in and day out in my life, and it becomes to be a witness of who he is. But if I'm running around acting like the world, they're looking at me and saying, the only difference between you and me is where you spend your weekend for a couple hours. Our testimony's got to go more than that. But our faith in Jesus and our faith in the word of God. Our faith when God says something and I do it, God always connects something to it. If you do this, I will bless you. Every promise of God is conditional. And so I can trust that when I do A, I'm going to get to B. Because God's word is true. Just like when you made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, you got saved. Now sometimes you may not feel like you're saved. How many of you ever went through that? It, 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 is, it has felt like you weren't really close to God and, and that the world was more appealing. We all have times like that. But yet the word of God is true. And I come back to what it says and, and I realize I've drifted away, but yet there's something in me that pulls me back because I'm saved. It's true regardless of how we feel. It's true regardless of what we see with our eyes. How many know when they were standing at the Red Sea? They had the Red Sea to their backs and the Pharaoh to their front. And there was no place to go. You can either be moved by what you see or you can follow God's command. Say, Mike, why are you preaching like that? Because I think we're getting ready to see miracles. I think, I think God is positioning us. I'm starting to see him do some stuff, and it's starting to get me excited. And at the same time, I feel this expectation beginning to build on the inside of my spirit that if I line myself up with the right with God, he is going to do some phenomenal things for me, with me, and around me. Because that's the kingdom way. You can't have this darkness come in without God responding with light. It's impossible. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And so there's several things. There's four points in this that he begins to deal with. A disbelief that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, Almighty God come in the flesh, is going to begin coming in like waves like we have never seen before. And and it can either be questioning his divinity or treating him like he is a different God than the God of the Old Testament. Jesus is Yahweh. In fact, even in this most sacred name of God is encoded who Jesus is, that he is the God with the nailed hand shall be revealed twice. He was the olive tav that became Yahweh Elohim because originally in Genesis 1-1, it was olive tav Elohim, then it was Yahweh Elohim, and then in the Psalms, David prophesied that Yahweh shall become our Yeshua. And it's all strategic. Because the Antichrist is none other than Nimrod, and one of the symbols of Nimrod is the eye, like the eye on the back of your dollar bill. That's Nimrod. And when you take apart the name Yeshua, it means the hand that 
dismantles or shatters the establishment of the eye. That's who Jesus is. He's going to come and he's going to clean Nimrod's clock once and for all. So is it Yahshua or, or, or Yahoshua or however many different? It's Yeshua. I have spoken with some of the top etymologists in Israel and those that deal with Bible codes and everything else. One of the things interesting they say is that Yahshua is not in the Bible code anywhere, but Yeshua is all over it. And it may have been pronounced Yahoshua, like Joshua, before Babylon, but after Babylon, when, when Jesus walked the face of the earth, they called him Yeshua. He was literally salvation walking on two legs. And he was Yahweh and come in the flesh. They're going to have an aversion for keeping the commandments of God. Has anybody heard that in the church lately? Anonomianism. Grace gives me an excuse to do whatever I want. I don't have to keep the commandments of God. That's Old Testament. No, it's one book by one God. God is not schizophrenic. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if he was almighty God come in the flesh, I think we better open up the book and find out what they are. But there's going to be this pressure. to move. If, if God can move you away from commandments, the apostle John already said that sin is the violation of the law. If he can move you away from the commandments, then what he's doing, he's setting you up for a lifestyle of sin once again. Because if you violate them after you're saved, it's still a sin. How many know that after you get saved, it's still thou shalt not commit adultery? Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. There's going to be a hatred for those that believe in Jesus, the real Jesus, as well as those that keep the commandments, the Jews. Well, what's one of the things that, that is the cry of radical Islam? First the Sunday keepers, then the Saturday keepers. Get the Christians, get the Jews. We're going to see that begin permeating. Why? Because right now there are two witnesses in the earth, the Jewish people and the true believers of the God of heaven and earth. And they're going to redefine what love is. The Apostle John says, here's how you show love for God. You keep his commandments. Here's how you show love for one another. You keep his commandments. In the last days, men will say they're showing their love by God by hunting people down and killing them and calling it service to God. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said that they're going to hunt you down. They're going to they're do all these things, and they're going to think they're doing God a service, not the God of the Bible. We must always keep our focus on who Jesus is, what he has done, and the life that he has called us to live. If we can do that, we're going to stabilize ourselves, and we're going to prepare ourselves for the days that are ahead. Now let's go on down here to verse 18 through 21 of 1 John 5. You see, I want, I want to learn how to be bulletproof. Not necessarily literal bullets, but how many know that the, 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 the weapons the enemy has that he can point against you? Anybody ever hit, been, been hit by a fiery dart? Sometimes I always think about that, you know, the, 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 our shield of faith can stand up against all the fiery darts of the enemy. And I remember one preacher got his tongue tied and he was preaching and he called, he called them diary farts. And, and I, I think that sometimes it's, it's, it just surrounds you. It's just everything of the enemy stinks. How many know that sulfur stinks? I want to know how to get protected of those things. I want to know how to walk in a place that makes it really, really, really hard for the devil to get to me. We find it here starting in verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Okay, let's stop. What sin? Violation of the commandments. So a born-again believer is not going to seek to violate the commandments. He's going to seek a way to keep them empowered by the Holy Spirit. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. We know that we are of God, and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. And I, I want to deal with he that keepeth himself. I want to know what that means. Does it mean that he keepeth himself in food all the time, you know? I used to keep myself in candy bars a lot by my desk, and let me know that, how that turned out. 
So there, there needs to be more than that. This word keepeth in the Greek is taurio, which means to attend to carefully, to take care of, to guard, a metaphor to keep one in the state which he is, to observe, to reserve, and to undergo something. And so those that keep themselves, what has he been talking about? The commandments of God. If I keep myself in the commandments, I'm not sinning. We need, we need to understand some basic things of the kingdom. What I say, what I think, and what I do release power. I'm created in the image of God. Now, I'm not saying you can create planets or anything about that, but how many know how about to create a holy life? How about to, to begin setting up some things in your life that what, what you're doing, have you ever seen anybody that you know what they're doing is setting themselves up for a fall? and they're going to get hurt, and things aren't going to go well, or they're going to destroy their business. They're doing the wrong things that, that begin sowing seeds that set up things for tomorrow to make things bad. When I do the commandments of God, I, I am releasing the force of righteousness in the earth that God can flow through and empower it for something in my life. When I violate the commandments... It's called sin. Sin releases power for the enemy to begin doing things in my life. And so if I keep myself, I am constantly sowing in the kingdom. I'm constantly doing in the kingdom. I'm constantly keeping myself in the kingdom. And I, by doing that, I establish a conduit in my life or a spiritual portal in my life that heaven can come in through me and flow through me out to the world around me. And there's no place for the devil to plug in. But if I start doing sin, I begin falling under and, and connecting to his kingdom, his ways of doing things. The very force that Lucifer created when he, when he did the five I wills, the Bible says iniquity was found in him or it was discovered in him. Iniquity is the force that drives Lucifer. It's his anointing. He perverted his anointing when he falls. And so when I begin to sin, I begin flowing under the anointing of Lucifer. And everything that he is begins to be released in my life. But if I'm over here and I'm walking in the kingdom of God, he has no place to plug in. This is what this is talking about here. Living clean, living and doing righteousness closes the doors to the devil and opens up the doors to God. But when I start disobeying God's commandments, I begin closing the doors of God's blessing in my life and I start opening up all the doors and say, devil, just come on in and take over. That's what he's talking about here. And he says, guys, don't do it. And so I wanted to make sure about this because not we're, now how many know when we're talking to keeping the commandments, it's not about getting saved. It's how to walk after you're saved. Once you get the devil out of your life, you want to keep him out. You don't want that Pharaoh to come back in and try to usurp authority over Jesus in your life. <coughs> this word touches in the Greek, haptamai, which means to fasten oneself to. You don't want the devil fastening himself to you. To cling to, to touch, to adhere, of carnal intercourse with women or cohabitation. There is an intimacy if he can touch you. How I many know in a marriage relationship there's a lot of touching? That's that level of intimacy. That's why God in the Old Testament, when they would enter into idolatry, he said, you're committing adultery against the Most High God. Well, if it's that way in the Old Testament, it's still that way in the New Testament. When I sin, God looks at that as adultery because, I, uh, because the devil has his own commandments and they're defined as sin. If you've ever done any research on Satanism at all, they do exactly the opposite of what God says. They try to violate the Ten Commandments every day. Why? Because that's the way of Satan. And it brings them into a more intimate relationship with Satan. But if I keep God's commandments, it brings me into a more intimate relationship with Almighty God. So if he can't touch me, he can't enter into that intimacy with me. Am I making sense today? That's 
of Levitical practice of having no fellowship with pagan practices. Don't touch these things. Don't do these things. Don't touch that which is unclean. And then the very last one is to touch or to assail anyone. And so it actually tells us what this means, that, that if I begin to walk in sin, Satan fastens himself to me and adheres to me and begins to replace my intimacy with God with intimacy with him so that he can assail me. All in that one little Greek word. But if I keep myself clean, he can't plug in. That's why if you do mess up, how many love the first part of 1 John? If you do mess up, we have an advocate with the Father. He is, considers it a righteous thing to cover that with his blood if I run to him. So the moment Satan trips you up and you ever do sin, you run to Jesus. You get it out of that blood and say, boy, disconnect me. I want that off of me. I don't need that on me because there's going to be more coming with that if I allow it to. But instead, I stay here where the blessings of God can flow. And in the days ahead, guys, we're going to need those blessings. We're going to need that power. We're going to need to get that conduit between us and heaven and that portal just as big as we can get it. I, I don't want one this big. I want one big enough I can drive a semi through. That's the type of portal I want to create in my life. He's saying here, and what, what John is trying to teach us is that when we keep the commandments by the power of the Holy Spirit, we do not allow the enemy to fasten or adhere himself to our lives. We're, we're not actively practicing sin, which is establishing intimate relationship with, with that demonic spirit. And it keeps us out of fellowship with the kingdom of darkness. I'm not going to enter in that intimacy. It's not going to be familiar to me. And it prevents him from making a direct assault because he has to have a legal right to do so. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, let's just go there real quick. I want you to see this. I'm pulling stuff out of my head out of the, out of the chapter that I just wrote for my new book. Revelation 12 and 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is salvation come and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his, of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down. I can't wait for that to happen. The accuser of the brethren is cast down. But what we need to, that, that accuser in the Greek means someone who comes before a judge to make accusations against you. That he is a prosecuting attorney. That he, and, until this happens in Revelation uh, 12, he, the Satan has access to the throne of God. If he can get you to sin, he can then be go through the throne of God and say, I have a right to do more because they're doing this. They've opened the door to me. It's legal. Everything of Satan's kingle, king, kingle, kingdom operates Uh, it, it's a kingle, like legal kingdom, I guess. That's what happens when you blend them together. Preachers just make new words sometimes. But it, it, it's, he's legalistic because everything, everything in this universe operates on laws. Physics operates on laws. Nature operates on laws. Everything in your body operates on laws. Violate those laws, you pay the price. What makes you think the spiritual realm, which is the mother realm of our dimensional reality, doesn't have laws? When I walk in God's laws, I'm not jumping off a building and, and saying as I plummet, there is no gravity, there is no gravity, there is no gravity, I refuse to believe in gravity. How many know you have a rude awakening that will only last for a millisecond when you hit the ground? God's kingdom operates on laws. Satan's kingdom operates on laws. And they're basically set in motion by the violation of God's laws. But everything is legal. The reason that we got saved because of the cross was because of the legal things that God wrote into the Torah that provided salvation. You take away the Torah, you take away the very legal foundation for your salvation. You can't do it. And Christians that preach against God's laws, they're actually operating in antinomianism, and you see the price being paid constantly in their lives because the wicked one touches them anytime he wants to. 
And I want you guys to, I want, I want you guys to the place where the enemy has a heck of a time getting a hold of you. He can't find a place that Jesus has not just permeated and fulfilled in, his, in your life. Now, I want to go to 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. And I want to connect that to 1 John 4, 17. By this we know that, the, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So he's, why, 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 how am I connecting that with 1 John 4, 17? Now listen to 1 John 4, 17. Here, herein is our love made maturific, perfect or matured, teleos that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, who's that talking about? Jesus. As he is now, right in this moment, he is ruling and reigning from heaven in a glorified state. So are we in this world. I looked at that and I said, what? And here's what God told me. He said, if I will begin to labor with everything within me to start living like Jesus did in the earth, fellowship with God, living the word, being obedient to the things of God, if I begin doing that, then who he is now will begin to flow to me. But if I don't try to walk like him now, I'm never going to experience that now. And see, we have so many believers get into mysticism because they simply won't do what Jesus did. Their theology won't let them do it because they've done away with the commandments. They've done away with all these things. Where was Jesus every Sabbath? Synagogue. Did he keep the, did he keep the feast? Yes. Did he keep kashrut? Yes. Did he perfectly keep all the commandments of God? Yes. And so if I strive to be like him and I'll look constantly to his spirit to enable me to be a witness in the earth by doing it just like he did, all of a sudden I begin building this portal over heaven in my life and all of a sudden who he is now begins to flow into me in this moment and I begin to have miracles because that's really the way Jesus did it. Jesus was just like the father. Come on. Just like the Father, and I won't do anything unless the Father shows me to do it. I won't say anything unless the Father shows me, tells me to say it. And he lined himself up with the Father. There was a portal in heaven, and who the Father was began to pour through him. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John is saying the same thing to you. If you start being like Jesus in the earth, you don't do anything unless he says to do it. You don't, you don't, you, you don't say anything unless he tells you to do it. And you start lining up with the way he lived his life. All of a sudden, who he is now begins to flow in you. And Jesus said it this way, greater works shall you do. Why? Because he has a greater position now than when he was walking the earth. We can't even get to the works that he did, much less the greater works, because we're doing everything but lining up with him. Get into the Gospels. Learn him. Know him. And begin to match what he was doing with the Torah so that you understand how to apply it in your life, right? When you do who he is now, sitting at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning victoriously, begins to flow in you. And the Apostle Paul said it this way, that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Because I'm so lost in him, you can't find me anymore. Now, if that won't get you happy, we'll go ahead and call 911 because you need an electric shock or something. You need to have them paddles put to your heart. If you can't see this and get excited and have this aha moment, this, this is how we tap into the power. This is the reason, because how many know I've been, around, I've been around charismatic stuff since I was 17. And I used to be taught, all you got to do is be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues. You're going to tap into all the power that you want, and everything's going to be wonderful. It's a kumbaya moment for the rest of your life. And I looked at a lot of charismatics, and I called them crazy maddocks. Because you can speak in tongues and not live like Jesus, and there isn't any power from heaven going to flow. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the mantle of Jesus' ministry coming on you so that as you line up to him, heaven can endorse it and that power will flow. Come on, James said, I'll say it this way. You show me your faith without works 
and I'll show you my faith by my works because I'll do what God says even if it goes the, the wrong way. If everybody else, I'll do what God says because he is God, I'm not. He is so wise that, that, on, that, that his IQ is beyond the comprehension of all the universe. He spoke one word and flew this entire universe into existence, and one day he's going to pull it back, and the Bible says the heavens are going to roll up like a scroll, all because he said, come here. That kind of wisdom. So if he said, don't do this, he knows that if I allow this into my life, the enemy begins putting his tendrils, his tentacles, into my life. I'm making up all kinds of words today, aren't I? That's what happened when my brain is faster than my mouth this morning. All these tentacles begin to tap into me, and it begins assaulting me and, and, and beginning to try to take over areas of my life through fellowship with him. But if I break that off, and this, oh, every, all of a sudden I get into more intimate relationship with Jesus, I get lost in his love, I get lost in his word, it's nothing for heaven to come down and manifest itself. Oh, guys, we need that. We need that. Just go through 1 John this week, and I want you to count how many times commandments is mentioned in 1 John. Do you think he's trying to make a point? And the only place that you'll find the word antichrist in the entire New Testament is 1 John. And so he's saying who Jesus is and the commandments are the antidote for the antichrist. Hmm. See, la, chew on that for a while. Because you're going to need to have some anti venom released into your life because the venom of the Antichrist is being released in unprecedented ways in everything that we do, in everything that we see in the news broadcast, uh, through television, through movies. There's a hidden agenda that's filled with venom. Venom. Come on, mouth. Venom to poison you with the seeds of the Antichrist. Because in the last days, it's going to be the seed of God versus the seed of the devil. And what seeds are you allowing into your life? I prefer that incorruptible seed of Almighty God. Well, Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but accomplish whereunto you have sent it. And, Father, I ask that you would make us absolutely cognizant of your commandments in everyday life. Father, let us follow them by the power of your spirit. And in every situation where our flesh wants to do one thing and your commandments say another, Father, let us have the grace of the kingdom to crucify the flesh and be obedient to your word. Father, we thank you. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name.